Hello, let's start with Elmish. Elmish is a library that uses model view update pattern. Basically, it has three flavors. Elmish Pavel React, which is based on the famous React framework. Elmish WPF, which allows you to develop WPF application by using Elmish. And finally, we have Elmish Summary, which we can develop mobile applications, also known as Pavelus. If we review Elmish components, we have a model which represents a snapshot of your application state. Then we have messages and events, which represents what actually happened in the past. In the command represents what is asked to happen. The difference between event and command is similar to the case that we have seen in the actor model. The init function is called when your application starts and returns the initial state of your application. The update function is perhaps one of the most important produces a new state and optionally new commands to process. The view is our UI, so it's a function that takes a state and generates a new UI. And finally, the program combines all of the above as the bootstrapper. To get started with Elmish, we can utilize pebble.elmish package. So how does Elmish work? First, we have a dispatch loop. This is run by the program and initially, it calls the init method, gets the state, and calls the view to render the initial state. Once our view is rendered, view triggers an event, such as a message, in this case, expand. For example, an expand message. This message is intercepted by the program, which is our dispatch loop, sent to the update function along with the current state. The update function processes the message as well as the state and returns another state along with an optional command. And finally, the program, if a command is returned, processes the command and generates further messages, or by using the updated state, it renders another view. In this slide, we see the Elmish's interaction along with the sub-widgets. So for this example, let's assume we have a button inside a widget. A user clicks the button inside this widget. Then the widget generates an increase message. Since widget is a sub-view of the main view, we have to wrap this message into a widget message as number three. Once this message is wrapped to widget message, at the next step, we send this wrapped message along with the main model to the main update. And the main update extracts the widget's message and then send it to the widget's update function. Finally, widget's update function sends another updated widget model and returns a command. Also as number seven, main update updates the main model along with the widget model and returns another command that probably wraps the widget's own command. And finally, program returns the main model. And finally, program sends the main model to main view. And that main view actually sends the widget model, which is inside the main model, to the widget view to be rendered. That way, the widget and the view is rendered. And finally, both functions return their respective HTML. If you were to review commands, in first case, the program sends a state to the update function of main update. Then it's passed to the child update and it's passed to the ch grandchild update if there is anything exists. And similarly, model and command return from each update function. But note that whenever we return such a thing, we always wrap it by the parent's type. We will see a detailed example of it. Even if you don't grasp it fully, don't worry. If you look at the association between events and commands, we have the message loop that runs as a program and our message loop basically generates events based on the UI interaction and it sends the current state. And our update function processes these event and state and generates a command and the state to the message loop. Now let's see how our typing application is converted to Elmish. Let's review our application source code. But before doing so, let's try to run the application. If we go and open a new terminal and run the fake build dash T watch, which I will talk about briefly. And if you open our browser and visit localhost 8081, then we see a very similar page with our previous exercise. And our typing application works exactly the same in our previous application. Let's see how this works. At first, we have initialized our fake end packet just as the way in the previous section. Let's review our packet dependencies. 
In the packet dependencies, we of course have our build group, which is used by the fake itself. In this case, it has few extra things such as fake JavaScript yarn module, which allows us to execute yarn commands. We also have some other helper fake packages. At upper side, we can see the Pavel packages that are used by our application. And most importantly, we need to install the .NET Pavel client tool by using this command. Once we have configured our packet dependencies, we have to configure our package.json. If you open our package.json, we see the following things. We have the Babel core as usual, the table loader, webpack, and webpack dev server, remote dev for debugging, and we have two extra plugins, copy webpack plugin and HTML webpack plugin, which we will see briefly, and the React itself. Our project is inside a typing speed solution. Again, we can see the there's one project in this solution. If you look at our build script, we will see the following. We have defined our tabulder as SRC, which is which our application is inside. We have defined the webpack config path. We have a helper function that allows us to run fable commands, which actually utilizes .NET exec fake helper. We have a yarn install command, which installs the yarn. We have a build command that actually builds our application for production. We have the watch target. We actually have run that that runs the application in development mode. We have the .NET restore target, which restored our solution. We have the build.NET target, which actually builds the target in the release mode. And finally, we have defined the dependencies as builds will trigger yarn install and that will eventually trigger .NET restore. Similarly, watch will trigger yarn install. And by default, we are always targeting the watch. Next. Let's review the webpack config.js. If you open that file, we can see the path function is loaded from the path module and webpack is loaded similarly. And two other plugins, HTML webpack plugin and copy webpack plugin are loaded. Next, we check if our build process is in production mode by using that if the command line includes the webpack dev server, then we conclude that we are not in production. Otherwise, we are in production because in the production mode, we don't use the dev server. Dev server is only for debugging. In addition to that, we are logging the current production mode. Next, we define a common plugin section. The motivation behind common plugins is that the shared plugins between the development mode and production mode are put to here. And we only have one plugin that actually is the HTML Webpack plugin. What HTML Webpack plugin does is it modifies the HTML so that our final build JavaScript is included in the correct section. The file name parameter denotes the output file name, whereas the template denotes the source file. If we look at our current index.html file, we will see there is no JavaScript included as a link. That's actually the duty of this HTML Webpack plugin, which writes the relevant link to our JavaScript file. By using the mod property, we define if our build should be production or development, depending on our is production variable, which is based on the command line. The entry denotes the main project, which is the entry point of our project is the F sharp file. The output denotes the location where our output files will be, which in this case, we say that we would like to put our output files to an upper folder in the public folder. Please note that when, when, this, when this script is executing from webpack's point of view, the current location points to the packages.json files location. For the path property of the output property, we are required to give a full path. So that's why we are using the path.join along with the derm name, which actually this transforms into the real full path name of this public folder. And for the file name, for production purposes, we want our JavaScript file to be named as name.hash.js, whereas for the development purposes, we don't care about the hash. The reason we use hash is it may help us for the caching scenarios. So if a new version of our JavaScript file is built, that will be named differently and it won't be cached by the browsers. This next line, dev tool module file name template, actually helps the webpack to find the source map files, which is used for debugging itself. We are basically saying that whenever you create a source file, just look at the real source path. Just look at the physical path of the source map files. And since we are using Windows, just in case it encounters with backslash, we are just transforming to the forward slashes. 
The next is we are choosing our plugins depending on the production mode. If we are in production, then we use the copy backpack plugin, which actually copies everything inside that folder. We are saying that if we build our project for the production, then copy everything inside src slash static. In that folder, we actually have our style sheet. Whereas if we are not in production build, we are using hot module replacement plugin, which allows us to change the code and directly reflect the changes. We use the name modules plugin to better denotion of the name to the console of the browser whenever a module is resolved. The dev tool attribute allows us to define the source map kind. So by default, we will really use source map, but there are other source map kinds such as eval source map and inline source map. Currently, we don't want to use source map for the production mode, but that's entirely optional. For the development server, which actually runs the webpack itself as a development server, we state that our content base is the src slash static folder so that whenever a file is required, webpack will be able to find it here. Note that we already have defined copy backpack plugin, but this copy backpack plugin will not be invoked when we are developing our code in development mode. So for the development mode, in order to serve our CSS file, we have to specify our content base. We specify the port number as 8081, and we enable the hot module reloading. Finally, we are saying that whenever you encounter an F-sharp or FS file, whenever Redpack encounters an F-sharp or FSX or FS file, it should use the Fabian loader to transform the F-sharp code into JavaScript. And this actually summarizes the Webpack config file. Next, let's look at our packet.references. In this file, we are importing our table packages as well as our .NET table tool. So you can just write these names manually, or if your Visual Studio code has the packet extension, you can right-click and install and restore packages, although the installation will still require you to add the package name manually. But also, you can add the packages through the packet.dependencies, and if you have the packet plugin, again, you can add the get packages if you right-click and the context menu will show you the other options possible with packet. So basically, these are the NuGet packages that we are using our project. We have the Pebble Core in browser. We have Almi stuff, the React browser debugger, hot model reloading, the Power Pack, and the, and the Pebble React. And let's also check out our project file. Our project file is a regular Microsoft.NET SDK file. Its target framework is .NET Standard 2.0, and it includes four files, packet itself. So by utilizing this, by importing this packet to store targets, we don't have to include each project in the project file. 